आर्काइव्स ऑफ प्रसार भारती प्रेजेंट्स द टाइमलेस ट्रेजर ऑफ गोल्डन एरा Hello and welcome to Living on the Edge. Forests in Asia and Africa contain some of the most diverse forms of wildlife in the world. Yet hunting for sport and trade is threatening animals with extinction. But the most significant cause of the destruction of species is the direct and indirect destruction of habitat. This week our program looks at the reasons behind the rapidly declining elephant population in India. We also reveal how the desert is being reclaimed in Rajasthan, show how some bricks are better than others. discover dinosaurs jurassic park missed and visit the midwestern united states to see why migratory birds make a stop along the platte river at the top of our program however we focus on an animal revered in indian tradition whose numbers are declining rapidly degradation of their habitat poaching and avoidable clashes with man are all taking their toll on the beleaguered elephant community living on the edge spent days trudging through forests waiting long hours to film herds and even being chased by wild elephants to bring you this report gori many story is a sad reflection of the plight of the animal and an indictment of project elephant In January 1993 a train collided with a herd of elephants in the Rajaji Park leaving this calf orphaned Raja as he is now called is a bewildered victim of the continuing clash between man and this magnificent animal Whether it's the killing of 28 people in 2 days in the northeast or the relentless poaching for tusks It is apparent that the relationship between man and this endangered animal has reached worrying proportions. What is at stake is the right, if you choose to call it that, of the elephant to graze, breed and migrate the way he's done for centuries in thick forests. It's these forests which allowed him to seek out the best grazing grounds as determined by the seasons and the rain. But today that is virtually impossible. The felling of forests The ever-growing expansion of agricultural lands and the hunting of elephants has left the animal uncertain and restive. We are driving through an area which looks uh, degraded now. Had we come here some 100 years ago, we would have driven through an excellent forest where tigers and elephants were living. Now we have human habitation everywhere and uh, you can see houses coming up and this uh, highway is uh, bustling with uh, traffic. coupled with the alien sounds of traffic and people that must surely be disconcerting for wild elephants is the creation of discontinuous forests as a result undisturbed corridors essential for elephant migration are largely non-existent if there is no such movement animals will continue to stay in one area and they will overuse the habitat and destroy the habitat actually this tree has been pushed by a, a bull elephant you can see the tusk mark of the bull it has i put the task here and exerting pressure on the tree it has pushed it down it's really amazing to see how such a big tree has been pushed by an elephant 
Added to this, corridors ensure that elephant populations mingle so that inbreeding is reduced to the minimum. If there is inbreeding and if the remaining animals uh, have a deleterious gene, that can spread through the population and which can uh, destroy the population eventually. But there are other short-term problems that have further exacerbated the plight of the pachyderms. The thinning of forest cover at the hands of man has led to the profusion of weeds. These weeds, which grow because sunlight reaches the forest floor more easily, choke off vital sources of food for the elephant. Left with little natural food, the elephant begins to stray and cultivates a taste for paddy and sugarcane, thus inviting more trouble with man. What makes it worse is the poaching for tusks. Traffic India, which monitors the wildlife trade, was able to secure a legal ban on elephant killing, but poaching continues unabated. This takes a further toll on the already beleaguered elephant, adding yet another element to an already vicious cycle. The largest illegal trade in the world is said to be narcotics. Second to that is believed to be the illegal trade in wildlife. The profits are immense. There are organizations, there are people, there are big gangs operating in this field. Perhaps the most worrying problem remains the implementation of laws against poaching. Today, poachers get away with a light fine and the masterminds are never caught. India has never tackled the organized trader. There are people who will actually pick up the gun and shoot an elephant and take away the ivory. But then it must eventually travel along a route. It becomes a commodity in trade. That is what we have recently discovered, that we must catch the trader, the mastermind. Unfortunately, government is not in a position to take actions against them. And, uh, and, and this should not go on forever because this can uh, suppress the morale of the forest staff who with great difficulty may catch a poacher who will be in the bottom of that link. But that kingpin, you know, he'll be able to produce another man who will be able to go and hunt inside the forest. Ironically, elephants have long been revered in India. Indeed, the sighting of an elephant was once considered a good omen. Villagers often welcomed herds with jaggery and many festivals are still incomplete without majestic elephants bedecked with flowers and ornaments. And yet today, man's relationship with this animal is at a crossroad. At stake is the very survival of the elephant that once roamed free, the master of all he surveyed. The launch of Project Elephant by the government of India reflects a belated but welcome attempt to save the dwindling elephant population from complete destruction. The action plan aims broadly at maintaining corridors, conservation management of the habitat, and the prevention of poaching. But, as is so often the case, Living on the Edge found out that implementation of the recommendations has not taken place. The objectives of the project has been finalized, the strategy is evolved, and the blueprint for the guidelines have also been issued to the states. It's only the detailed project report which we are waiting. Now, we have no scheme scheme Enforcement machinery does take it seriously, but unfortunately, the infrastructural changes which are needed to make it effective, to put teeth in it, to put bite in it, is still not there. The absence of quick remedial action will not only result in the disappearance of a species that is being rapidly decimated, but will also increase the number of avoidable clashes between man and animal. For unless elephants feed and breathe the way they have always done, future generations will only be acquainted with them through books, films and photographs. The question is, is that a price worth paying? There are some things that people don't know about the world. And when they get out of their own place, we think that there was something that was lost here. And the loss of the loss of the loss of the loss. अगर हाथी नहीं होगा तो ये जंगल भी नहीं होंगे और अगर जंगल नहीं होंगे तो मतलब पानी नहीं होगा और पानी नहीं होगा तो हम भी नहीं होंगे
still to come, arresting the march of the desert, why some bricks are better than others, the dinosaurs Jurassic Park missed, and why migratory birds make a stop along the Platte River in the Midwestern United States. Most Javans retire after 15 years of military service. But in Bikaner in Rajasthan, a dedicated and disciplined group of ex-servicemen are waging a war. It's a war of attrition against nature to arrest the march of the desert and plant trees where once not a shrub was seen. Priya Somaya visited the Eco Task Force, as they are now called, and came back amazed by their perseverance and grit, despite extreme climatic conditions. When the wind takes over and the sun blazes on and shifting sands challenge all plant life, there is indeed barrenness. Eleven years ago, a unique experiment began in this starkly barren area in Bikaner district when the ecological task force began operations. Part of the territorial army, the force consisted of over 500 ex-servicemen, many of whom had served in Kashmir and the Northeast. Some were even veterans from the Bangladesh war. But unlike the life they had been trained for, their weapons were not rifles, but spades. Their adversaries were not enemy soldiers, but nature itself. And their mission, unlike any military operation, was to green this scorched land. The odds are formidable. Even as we filmed, the temperature touched an unbelievable 50 degrees centigrade. Even early in the morning, the sun was unbearable. And yet, the Eco Task Force had already received its orders for the day. Their work chalked out, the men set about their task with vigor. For them, there was no respite. Conditioned to withstand formidable hardships, these men carry out their task in true military fashion. But even the former Javans could scarcely have imagined what their years of training had prepared them for. The idea of the force is not new. It was the famous agronomist Norman Borlaug who first hit upon the idea of using dedicated, disciplined ex-servicemen for ecological work. Inspired by this, Indira Gandhi set up the Eco Task Force, which is today also greening areas in Masuri, Pithoragar and Jammu. The Forest Department funds the operation and provides plants and the necessary infrastructure for this battalion, which is doing plantation work along the Indira Gandhi Canal. The canal itself was dug to bring water to the parched desert lands of Rajasthan, but it was found that drifting sands virtually silted up the canal, and plantations along the route seemed to be the only way out. Yet few realize the daunting task which faces these men who have left their families and homes even after retirement. Although employment is undoubtedly a consideration, the dedication of these men can be gauged by the attachment to the plants they nurture. पहले हमारा पेट का भी सवाल है कि हमारे को तनखा भी मिलती है बराबर और इसको पालते हम बच्चे की तरह ताकि हम इसको पालेंगे तो हर जानवर भी इसके नीचे बैठेंगे और दुनिया में हमारा नाम भी रहेंगे कभी 128 ये बटालियन यहां काम किया है जब मैं नया आया था जब मेरे को ये मतलब पौधे लगाने के बारे में पता नहीं था लेकिन एक दूसरे के साथ में रहे उन्होंने एक दूसरे ने बताया मेरे को कि भाई इस तरीके से पौधा लगाया जाता है इस तरीके से पानी पाया जाता है और उसके बाद मैंने पौधा लगाना शुरू किया तकरीबन मैंने 
पौने दो या दो लाख पौधे मैंने मेरे हाथ से लगाए This is not a mere statistic when you consider that most people have not planted a single tree in their entire lifetime. Besides, planting and nurturing saplings in the desert is an unenviable task. Only constant vigilance helps in the extreme climatic conditions. सबसे ज्यादा यहां धूप है. दूसरे यहां चमक बहुत ज्यादा है टिब्बों के अंदर. और तीसरा सरफ है सर यहां. और बाकी शाम के लिए मच्छर भी बहुत है. The fact that the Eco Task Force has successfully countered the challenge of nature can be gauged by lush green plantations in areas where once not a single tree was seen. Plant by plant and year after year, relentless nurturing has resulted in the greening of 9000 hectares. And shifting sands which destroy agricultural land, clog canals and disrupt plant life are gradually being tamed by these plantations. In fact, it's the trees along the Indira Gandhi Canal that have helped check siltation and increase the flow of water to hundreds of Rajasthani villages that face drought and famine each year. Yet, despite its success in arresting the march of the desert, the Ministry of Forests has ordered cuts in the task force budget. The ministry claims the same results can be achieved at a lower cost by the forest department. This view, however, is countered by others. who feel that the disciplined result oriented work of the eco task force cannot be matched by any other group so a trained soldier maybe ex service man but he has been in service for 15 years he is a disciplined soldier he is working every day on the same task where a labor if is implied he will come off and on for now however These men are laid off for four months a year. Not only are they without pay, but they also feel their plants are neglected. क्योंकि हम जब इधर से छोड़ के चले जाते हैं, तो पौधे हमारे पीछे बढ़ जाते हैं। फिर हम उधर गांव में चार महीने रह के यहाँ आते हैं, तो हमारे नहीं तो यहाँ पौधे मिलते हैं। और नहीं हमारे को पूरा सेमोंड मिलता है। Although many Javans are disillusioned, their commanding officer is optimistic about the future of the Eco Task Force. <laughs> There is a lot of work yet to be done. because it is just the beginning and therefore few more units can be raised at least in rajasthan if possible every state should have one to two more ecological battalion in bikaner however the battle with nature continues for the men honored with the indira priyadarshini vriksha mitra award in 1989 it's another day of sweltering heat and endless trekking to plant precious trees which will forever change the face of this land still to come why some bricks are better than others dinosaurs jurassic park missed and why migratory birds make a stop along the platte river in the midwestern united states One of the greatest single sources of air pollution is a thermal power plant which converts fossil fuels like coal into electricity. Not only are huge quantities of smoke spewed out into the atmosphere, but byproducts like fly ash are difficult to dispose of and are hazardous to health. But recently an innovative use has been found for fly ash that could solve part of the problem. Sunil Manoran reports. One of the byproducts of power generation in India's thermal plants is fly ash, which is hazardous to health as well as to the environment. And as long as coal is used as a fuel, the problem can only worsen. क्या होता है राख से बताइए? राख से जैसे जी आवाज़ चलती है ना रोज में से वो धूल उड़ती है और सांस के साथ वो आती है. बस खांसी में दांसी सी हो जाती है गले के में फांसी में लगने लगती है. A closer look at the problem reveals that only 2% of an estimated yearly accumulation of 45 million tons is recycled countrywide. And if recycling is the key, then bricks made of fly ash could just be a viable solution. Here, barely a kilometer away from the Badarpur thermal power plant, a compressor shapes fly ash bricks. 
The blocks are then sun dried and are ready to use. Playa ash bricks are eco friendly in many, in many ways. One is that they prevent topsoil erosion. Means the clay which we are digging towards clay brick production that can be avoided by using fly ash. Especially for phalgy technology, we don't use any heat. There is no thermal energy requirement. The usefulness of fly ash bricks, however, goes further. They could well fill the gap in the supply of conventional bricks. It is estimated that there will be a shortage of 55,000 million bricks during the eighth plan period, ending 1995. But few realize that conventional bricks need the wood of precious trees to fire them. That topsoil is a primary constituent. And that the inevitable pits which are dug are a breeding ground for mosquitoes. Perhaps an important consideration then is, are fly ash bricks an effective substitute? Let us conduct a small experiment and see how strong these fly ash bricks really are as compared to the conventional bricks. Oof. Oh, pretty strong, is it? But even if the strength of fly ash bricks is established, the cost option could well hold the key to market viability. With regard to cost, phalgy bricks are equal to clay brick. And in some places, phalgy brick may be cheaper where the raw materials are available in and around. And with the government actively supporting fly ash technology and allowing income tax exemption, the new bricks could well become a competitive option. The first fly ash brick plants have already been set up, fueling speculation that these new building blocks could well fashion future construction. If you think Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park is the last word on dinosaurs, think again. At the Smithsonian Institute of Natural History in Washington, D.C., the evolution of dinosaurs is the subject of a fascinating exhibition that goes back to 25 million years. Here's a report. The Triassic period, 225 million years ago, the continents were one large landmass covered with dense forests of 30-meter trees, and giant creatures called dinosaurs first walked the earth. At the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., the most up-to-date look at this prehistoric world can be seen in the exhibition, Dinosaurs, a Global View. It traces the evolution of the dinosaur based on the most recent scientific research gathered from around the world. From fossil bones, bone beds, tracks and plant traces, artists have produced previously unseen images of the dinosaur world. Group interaction and feeding structure, communal resting grounds and the relationship between the predators and the prey. More fossilized skin impressions are also being found resulting in dinosaur models made with captivating detail. The exhibition was organized by the husband and wife paleontology team of Sylvia and Stephen Jerkos from the United States. Presentation of their work is made easier since both are artists as well. Detailed illustrations of many other dinosaur species are available on canvas. They not only entertain but educate as well by destroying the stereotype of the sluggish, solitary dinosaur and creating images of limber and active creatures living in a dynamic world. One bird that can scarcely be described as sluggish or solitary is the migratory waterfowl. Each year, hundreds of these birds travel thousands of kilometers from Mexico to Siberia. But every time they make this journey, they make a stop along the Platte River in the Midwestern United States. And they've been doing this for thousands of years. Here's a report. Migratory waterfowl have been making this stop along the Platte River in the Midwestern US every spring for millions of years. And here for a few weeks are found the world's largest concentration of sand hill cranes. 
They are pausing on the epic journey from as far south as Mexico before they continue on to eastern Siberia and northern Canada. Thousands of cranes come here to rest and to feed. The Platte River offers them a special environment, but one that is dwindling due to farming and damming of the river. John Walker is one of the many fighting to preserve the ancient character of the river. Platte is the only one that flows across a huge alluvial plain like we have here that's several miles wide and provides the wetland habitat that's immediately adjacent to the river. And it's this wetland habitat that's so important. About one quarter of the bird's habitat remain unchanged. Conservationists are raising this issue and government regulators say that future development along the river will have to account for the needs of the sandhill crane and other migratory birds. <laughs>